Okay, folks, thanks very much for uh, coming. Our, um, we're very lucky tonight to have uh, Teresa Whalen here from the Pentagon. Teresa is currently the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for uh, African Affairs within the Office of the Secretary of Defense responsible for Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and as she may mention tonight, there is actually a new uh, unified combatant command being created um, for all of Africa. And so her bailiwick will actually increase by five countries, is it? Mm -hmm. And she'll be uh, uh, in charge of 53 countries in Africa uh, for the Pentagon. Teresa has had uh, a 15 year career uh, in the defense establishment, um, most of it in Africa. Uh, with responsibilities in the past for South Africa, Southern Africa, West Africa. Um, and, and with three years, uh, which is not really a break in the sense that she went out of the frying pan and into the fire uh, and covered the <coughs> Balkans for three years at the time of the uh, Kosovo crisis, uh, including as the uh, uh, NATO team chief on the Balkans task force uh, and then the deputy chief of staff. Uh, on the Balkans task force. So she's an expert on uh, humanitarian crises, national security issues, and um, the topic tonight is African security and U.S. interests, the problem of ungoverned spaces. And I think the fact that the title uses the term interests rather than humanitarian interests or national security interests is because we, we have both of these at least these two kinds of interests in Africa. Um, and uh, sometimes they actually come together. So if you're reading today's newspaper about an ongoing intervention in Somalia, it's, it's an intervention that maybe was motivated for national security purposes because of terrorism concerns, but part of the consequence is that we now have a little bit of a humanitarian uh, emergency uh, in the country. So uh, Africa is a place that even if we try to ignore it, it doesn't go away. Um, and Teresa has really been in the forefront of trying to get the U.S. government and the Defense Department to focus on this in a, in a coherent way. So um, just, just to finish up her, her resume, she has uh, master's degrees, two of them, uh, one in national security studies from Georgetown, uh, another in national security strategy from the National War College. And I can't think of a more qualified uh, official to come here and talk on this topic. So please welcome Teresa Wellen. It works. Great. All right. Well, thanks very much. Thank you for having me. Um, if you don't mind, I actually dressed for the snow in uh, Washington this morning. That's what you're missing, Greg. Um, I may have very disappointed. Yeah. So um, I'm going to take off my jacket and be a little bit more formal. Um, what I thought we'd do tonight is uh, kind of go through, and oh, by the way, if you guys didn't know, the Defense Department, everybody in Washington knows we are infamous for our PowerPoint graphics, so uh, we always have to talk with briefing slides, so we, it's, a, it's our crutch, it's my crutch, uh, so I'm going to use my crutch tonight. But we'll go through, talk about, a little bit about the current African environment, uh, the problem of ungoverned space, reducing ungoverned space. Uh, although that's uh, a lot e uh, not as easy uh, as it might seem. Uh, how we, the Department of Defense, approach our security strategy in Africa, and, uh, and then talk a bit about the U.S. Africa Command. Um, the Sub-Saharan African Environment, okay. Uh, constant security, political, and economic crises. No big surprise there. Um, and Alan just mentioned one of the the more recent and, and ongoing, well, it's, it's been ongoing since 1991, but it, of course, flares up, and uh, it has flared up recently in Somalia. But we also now have, of course, we have Sudan, we have Chad, uh, we have even in West Africa, just as we get uh, Liberia and Sierra Leone uh, headed in the right direction, we have Cote d'Ivoire, we have Guinea uh, that is... Uh, tilting right now, depending upon what happens to Guinea and President Conte. So the continent is in sort of this constant state of turmoil. Um, another factor that we, we've got that has, has always been a problem, continues to be a problem, is the issue of government corruption. It's pervasive. 
uh, in, there are very few places, unfortunately, in Africa that you can go where corruption really is not a factor in the governance of the country. Um, unfortunately, some of the, the African powerhouses like Nigeria, Kenya, Angola, uh, corruption is, uh, is the major factor in the way they govern. Um, they actually govern through corruption. Uh, they are, in, in, for all intents and purposes, kleptocracies. Uh, the other factor in the current environment is the, the issue of, of unreliable capacities for internal security and law enforcement. Now, of course, that's not, uh, a, not a big surprise to most folks who look at the African environment, but even in places such as South Africa, we have issues with uh, capacity for internal security and law enforcement, as I think has been evidenced uh, in, a, in a major public way recently by the deaths of, of some uh, very uh, prominent South African uh, citizens. So you take sort of this, and this is just a summary of, of the major components of the African environment. There are obviously other, uh, there, there are sub-bullets to this that uh, you could go into much more detail, but this kind of wraps it up. And you get to sort of the bottom line, which is the lack of governance capacity combined with these challenges tends to make Africa an attractive place for extremists, terrorists, and, and other criminals who are seeking to ply their trade. So, got that African environment. Now, how does the U.S. sort of approach, uh, what's, our, what's the underlying analytical approach to uh, the African environment, maybe not just the African environment, but even other third world environments and the global environment, the global security environment. First, can't predict events with precision. Okay, no big surprise. We missed the fall of the wall. We missed, well, we missed 9-11, etc. You can go back in U.S. history and you can identify all kinds of, of occasions in which we failed to predict events with precision. So we know that. So what's, why is that significant now? Well, it's a little bit more significant now because at least during the Cold War, you had a sort of bipolar construct that you could operate in in terms of analyzing trends. Uh, and while you couldn't get, you couldn't hit things precisely, you generally at least had this construct to understand the world in, and there were rules that sort of governed how you operated within the bipolar Cold War world. Now, it's not a bipolar world anymore. It's a much more complex world. And there, there are, there's no sort of, other than the United States, the, the sort of single uh, superpower left. There is no other center of gravity. And you also have no rules. So in that kind of environment, the fact that we can't predict events with precision becomes even, even more of a challenge in terms of planning for and protecting U.S. national security interests. So given that, you get to a point where you really need to recognize that you've got to take measures, preventative measures, to the extent possible to prevent problems from becoming crises and, and crises from sort of evolving to catastrophes. Since you can't predict events with precision, you are, you are better off trying to address issues before they become uh, a serious threat to U.S. security. The last component of our thinking these days is that we have to improve our capacity to work together to address problems, security problems, that are common across the, uh, across the international environment. That's not just that the idea of working together doesn't simply apply to working with our European allies. It does, obviously, but it's not just working with the Europeans or working with other countries. It also actually refers to the way we need to work within the U.S. government. And for all intents and purposes, the, the fact that the threat is more diffuse, the threat is more complex, means that we really are not going to be effective in addressing the threats that we face in the post-9-11 security environment unless we break down not only sort of our national stovepipes and, and approaching things in a unilateral context, but also internally within the U.S. government, our organizational stovepipes. 
Okay, let's talk a little bit about the problem of ungoverned space. Definition of ungoverned space, physical or non-physical area where there's an absence of state capacity to exercise control. This is a key enabling or contributing factor to that increases the complexity uh, and also the, de the geographic distribution of the threats to U.S. security in, in the post-9-11 environment. If you think about it, prior to 9-11, what we were really worried about in terms of threats to U.S. security was not ungoverned space. I mean, at worst, ungoverned space, and it did exist, obviously, prior to 9-11. It's, it, it's not new. Uh, we just didn't pay attention to it. At worst, we thought it was a law enforcement problem and a national law enforcement problem at that. It wasn't a security problem. It wasn't – no one really cared. It wasn't a threat to the United States that the government in Mali couldn't control – territory 50 miles outside the capital of Bamako. It, that was not uh, an issue from a U.S. security standpoint. What we worried about actually was governed space. Uh, we, you know, the, the most extreme example of governed space, the most extreme governed space would be authoritarian or totalitarian regimes. Those were the threats that we focused on because they could develop the military capacity to, to threaten the United States. At least that's the way we looked at it. Then, of course, our eyes were open on 9-11. Well, some of us actually had, had different views prior to 9-11 and had concerns about ungoverned space, but they were, they were not necessarily appreciated in, in terms of the overall U.S. strategic outlook. But on 9-11, everyone's eyes were opened, and people began to realize that these places where there is no government control are actually potentially very dangerous for the United States. And that, of course, increases the complexity of our security problem enormously because now you're not just worried about looking at, say, the Soviet, the Soviet Union as a, a security problem set or the Middle East as a geographic security problem set or North Korea, but you really essentially your, your problem set is the whole globe because you can have a security problem emanate from Afghanistan. You can have it emanate from some remote corner of the Philippines. You can have it emanate from some remote corner of northern Niger near the, uh, the Libyan border. So this, this tremendously increases the difficulty uh, that we have in terms of managing our security problem because you've got essentially terrorists and other nefarious characters who take advantage of this ungoverned space to ply their trades. Looking at the definitions sort of in a little bit more detail, and on the side of the slide over here, the left side, you have sort of non-physical space and physical space uh, in a uh, – non-physical on the bottom and physical on the top. Uh, obviously, physical space – ungoverned territories, uh, terrain, rugged, remote, you know, talking northern Mali or Niger um, and, and other parts of the continent. Uh, maritime space is, is something that a lot of people actually forget about but is increasingly important, uh, particularly in the context of Africa. It's important both economically uh, because that's where tremendous amount of natural resources are, not just not just oil. Everybody thinks of oil, and that's true, but also fish. Um, and that's very important, potentially important to African, uh, African countries and governments if they can tap into that resource. So those, those physical areas are extremely important in the context of ungoverned space. Then you have sort of – you have competing governance, which is – there's both a, sort of a physical and a non-physical manifestation of the competing governance uh, issue. Sovereign states' inability or unwillingness to exercise authority over a whole part of its country. Okay, the physical manifestation of that would be, shall we say, Somalia right now. Um, the, the actually, the sovereign government, and that's a little bit debatable, but uh, it can't exercise control over anything more than I think the building that it that houses itself in in Mogadishu. Uh, but you also have a similar problems, say, in the Niger Delta in uh, in Nigeria. 
Um, for all intents and purposes, Abuja does not exercise any control over the delta any longer. Um, so that's, that's a sort of physical example. But a non-physical example would be a case where you have a government that does not have the resources to uh, provide education to its populace. And so it gets an outside power to come in, say Saudi Arabia, that has lots of money, and Saudi Arabia essentially funds education for that particular government. Well, what does Saudi Arabia bring in, though, when they fund the education? They bring in their style of education, which in a Muslim country, uh, obviously, you're talking the Wahhabist principles, and uh, that is uh, oftentimes a, the, the beginning of the path towards the radicalization of the populace. So essentially, that country uh, ha gives up uh, a certain amount of its governance over, a, you know, not its territory, but actually in some contexts, an even more important uh, component of its, uh, its authority. Exploitation of legal principles. Now we're really down into sort of the non-physical aspects. This is, a, in the context of Africa, oftentimes, of course, you don't have any legal principles to exploit, and that's a problem. But there are also places where, of course, you do have laws, but the laws are weak or have loopholes in them that allow outsiders to utilize that country to sort of facilitate their operations by, say, for example, getting citizenship documents or other kinds of papers, passports, identity documents, that allow them to travel as someone else. Uh, and it's all perfectly legal. They're not stolen. It's, it's all done within the law. But these are things that actually facilitate operations of terrorists and also uh, drug smugglers and, and others, uh, those that traffic in persons, etc. Um, South Africa actually has a, a huge problem with this. And they're, they are trying to fix it, but these are the kinds of things that we find in Africa uh, in, in places as sophisticated as South Africa as well as uh, some of the, the less sophisticated countries on the continent. And then, of course, opaque areas of activity where governments can't monitor what's going on. Obviously, the most simplistic form of that is smuggling. Uh, smuggling is a way of life in Africa. They smuggle everything from cigarettes to gasoline, but the more important things that they smuggle are weapons. They also smuggle diamonds. They smuggle oil. Um, the, the oil smuggling business in Nigeria uh, it generates, I mean, there are some estimates that it generates in excess of $2 billion a year in revenues for, for the various smugglers. So there's a lot of money there's, that, out there that is not accounted for. Uh, and, of course, money is a key factor in advancing terrorist operations. Okay, so taking a look, take the ungoverned space construct that we just talked about and look at the sort of the traditional definitions, uh, the, the classic definitions of the military challenges that we, we face. Obviously, traditional uh, armies, navies, etc. The disruptive, uh, which is obviously something that we're always, we're always concerned about. Who's going to come up with the technology that can, say, defeat our stealth technology? Or, uh, for example, a, a real, real life example, China and the ASAT. Um, that is potentially very disruptive uh, development in terms of military challenges. Space is no longer uh, a sanctuary. Catastrophic weapons of mass destruction. And then there's irregular down the bottom. We, irregular has always been there. We've confronted irregular threats uh, throughout our history. Confronted it in the Philippines. We confronted it in Vietnam. We've confronted it in other areas um, around the globe. But in terms of our strategic thinking, irregular threats were never seen as a, as a strategic threat. Um, it was, the other three were considered to be the strategic threats. But essentially, in the era of ungoverned space, you've got to pay attention to all four of these. Um, and so that, again, changes your calculations a bit. And if you look at it in, in terms of the, the relevance of ungoverned space to these threats, obviously, the traditional threat is probably something that's really only going to manifest itself in governed space, in, in countries that, that have, uh, 
have the capability to govern themselves and produce conventional militaries. And the disruptive threats, probably the same thing. You've got to have the technology to be able to do that, so we're talking governed space. But both catastrophic and irregular threats can actually uh, manifest themselves in ungoverned space. Catastrophic, not so much because you have a country that uh, produces a weapon of mass destruction, but you have a country that might have the raw materials that, can, that are key to a weapon of mass destruction, or you have a country that because it does not control its ports uh, sufficiently or its transportation nodes sufficiently, can serve as a, a transit zone for a weapon of mass destruction that has been built someplace else. Um, so that's why we have uh, both of those issues uh, from a traditional military threat challenge uh, in, in the ungoverned space context. Okay, so talking about reducing ungoverned space. It's a threat, so we want to reduce it. So what are the things that we can do, from at least from a defense perspective? Obviously, education is critical. Um, civilian education, I, it facilitates good governance, facilitates economic opportunity. But we don't want to forget about the military as well. You don't want militaries in third world countries in ungoverned space to essentially be the dumping grounds for the uneducated members of society. Uh, because that's a, that's a cascading series of problems uh, in terms of the, the capacity of that military to provide the security for the country. So you've got to address the education of, of soldiers as well as the education of civilians. Strong civilian and military working relationships. You've got to have a trust between the civilian government and the, and the military. Now, uh, particularly, I mean, in some cases, the military is the government, but that is actually less and less uh, a case in Africa. Uh, that is more uh, past history in Africa as opposed to present. But given that now you have civilian governments and then you have separate military establishments, if there is not a, a trust, a uh, working level trust between those two components of, of government, you've got serious problems in terms of addressing your ungoverned space problem. If, if the civilians don't trust the military, then oftentimes what they do is they leave the military weak and unable to uh, perform its duties. The flip side of that is that if the military is, is too strong, it can become an alternate source of power. So you need to make sure that that's kept in balance. Providing humanitarian assistance goes towards the the addressing some of the underlying problems of society. It's not a long-term fix, it's a short-term fix, but the, the short-term effects sometimes reduce some of the, the angst and the hopelessness that oftentimes leads young men to, uh, to join more radical organizations and to adopt more radical philosophies. I, I spoke a few minutes ago again about military education, but there's of course providing training specific to the military skill sets and, and also military assistance in order to help build capacity to control territory. Enforcing fair laws and regulations, it goes after the corruption issue. And if that isn't really, if that is not addressed in Africa, you, we are going to have continued problems in terms of, of promoting good governance and reducing ungoverned space. And then, of course, responsible civil government. Take all those things that we just talked about, and let's talk a little bit about how how do you achieve uh, those uh, those goals. If you want to build your CT capacity, you need two things: you need your national security capacity, your your armed forces built up. But you also need your justice and law enforcement capacity. You cannot do effective counterterrorism unless both of those muscles are, are balanced appropriately. But you can't just work on those two muscles because if you don't have economic capacity and administrative capacity, you're not going to be able to sustain the national security capacity that you build because you won't either be able to afford it or you won't be able to manage it. 
And if you don't have political institutions in civil society, it's also going to be difficult for you to sustain your economic and administrative capacity as well as uh, promote your justice, the justice in the legal sector. So the bottom line is that you can't just fix one problem, one, one problem set here and solve your problem. You've got to work in all of the areas. And, and if you don't, you can get the whole system out of balance and that can be as much of a problem as the ungoverned space problem was. So one of the things that, that, and this goes back to what I talked about early on in terms of cooperation, the needing to work together, essentially within the U.S. government, if we want to address these problems, we actually have to work across our bureaucratic and organizational stovepipes in ways that we have not done to date. And this is something that is very much being discussed within uh, in Washington about how to do this, how to do this better. It's something that, that we in the Defense Department are very concerned about. And I'll, I'll go into this a little bit more when I start talking about the, the Africa Command. When we do try and work in Africa, and we, when we try and address those areas, the, the justice and the legal areas, the national security areas, the economic areas, the, the political institutions, we face a number of challenges. First, you've got the cultural differences. And some of the, the cultural differences that impact us when we go and we try to build capacity in Africa are Africans generally have a different concept of the future than we do. They look more short term, we tend to look medium to long term. And one of the things that their short term outlook tends to do is it, it makes it more difficult for them to do the kinds of long term planning in, in any discipline um, that is necessary in order to build and run institutions uh, effectively. So. We, we have to overcome this when we work with them and overcome their tendency to really not think much past the next 24 hours. Um, another cultural difference that, that we, I think, Americans probably confront in Africa more than maybe some of our European colleagues is concepts of time. We are, tend to be extremely impatient. Uh, Africans, uh, in general, are much more patient than we are. Uh, and so that's, that's also something that we have to adjust to when, when we go in and we do training, particularly in the military, we have to adjust our pace. We also try and get them to adjust a little bit towards our pace, but it's a, uh, it's a negotiation all along. Corruption, I've mentioned this several times, it is a huge, huge challenge. It's a challenge in the military down to the platoon leader level who doesn't dole out the, the total amount of pay to his troops, he keeps some for himself, all the way up, of course, to the presidents uh, and senior leaderships of African countries. And so when you go in and you try to build governance, good governance capacity, of course, everybody shakes their head and says, yeah, that's a great idea. We want to govern our country better. But then when you start getting into areas where it starts to hit the pocketbooks, you start getting people to sh they start shutting down, and that continues to be a, a dilemma that we face. Uh, and and one of the things that is going to make this process of of trying to help build good governance in Africa a very long and slow one. I think with persistence we can get there, but it is going to be it is it's not going to happen overnight. Um, lack of adequate health care and then HIV/AIDS. Why is, why is that a challenge in terms of training Africans or working with Africans to build capacity? Well, if half your workforce doesn't show up on any given day because they are out sick, uh, you've got a problem. Um, you've also got a problem with uh, the mortality rates uh, and the average age which African people live to is, uh, you know, we're, we're looking in many cases in the 40s, 50s, um, and the, the period between 30 and 60 is, tends to be the most productive periods of, of the adult life. Uh, and if you've got people that are dying 
uh, when they're right at the peak and there are people that you have trained, there are people that have, uh, have some education, uh, you've lost your capable workforce. So the, the lack of adequate health care impacts on a day-to-day -day basis, but it also impacts in terms of the demographics and the, the people that we have to work with in terms of building capacity. Uh, same thing with HIV AIDS, uh, although that has the most impact in, in Southern Africa um, because that's where the rates are highest. The democratic institution is not fully functional. Sometimes we go in and we see on paper these institutions, democratic institutions within African governments, and we make assumptions of, about their capacity. But nine times out of ten, those assumptions tend to be wrong. Usually, you've got an individual with a nameplate on the door, as opposed to uh, a functioning institution that you can actually plug into and do something. <coughs> so you're actually working with individual people as opposed to organizations. And that also makes the challenge, uh, makes it much more challenging. Same thing with the judicial system. And then the high poverty rates, in terms, at least in terms of military training, that means that we've got to bring just about everything with us, including uh, the equipment for the, uh, the military to train on. The next couple of slides, what I was going to do is just take a look at the different regions of Africa and apply some of the ungoverned space definitions to some of the things that are going on. Uh, and West Africa comes up first. Ungoverned territories, you've got the border area between North Africa and the Sahel, the Gulf of Guinea area, the Niger Delta, which I mentioned. Competing governance is also a Niger Delta <coughs> issue, and Northern Mali, where the, the Tuaregs uh, mm. continue uh, to exert uh, their the sort of their own influence over uh, the uh, governance in northern Mali, and it's not necessarily uh, in in concert with what's coming out of Bamako. Opaque areas of activity, diamond trade, still uh, despite the Kimberley process and attempts to regulate the diamond trade, there is still extensive amount of smuggling uh, in uh, in the West African area, Sierra Leone. Illegal weapons and drug trafficking actually is becoming a, a growing problem uh, in, in West Africa. East Africa, Somalia, Kenya, uh, Sudan, and Somalia coastal waters. I think uh, there, uh, a couple of months ago, actually last spring I guess it was, uh, the uh, Somali coastal waters got a lot of notoriety <laughs> because of the uh, resurrection of a, of a grand old trade called piracy. And um, it, uh, it dropped off for a little while there, but now has uh, become, uh, has popped up again with a vessel recently uh, taken by Somali pirates. Competing governance, you've got Somalia, as we mentioned, the Agadan area of Ethiopia, where you have uh, Ethiopian rebels, uh, ONLF, that challenges the authority of the Ethiopian government, and for all intents and purposes, uh, the Ethiopian government does not have that much control over the Agaden. What control they have, they have to fight for and, and defend with the Ethiopian military. Northern Uganda with the Lord's Resistance Army. Uh, and then even southwestern Ethiopia is coming up on the radar screen. There is uh, Islamic fundamentalism that's growing in that area, and that is becoming mixed in with uh, ethnic, uh, traditional ethnic tensions. And uh, that is becoming an area where we may see additional problems in terms of competing governance. And then exploitation of legal principles, uh, the Kenyan court system and the prosecution of terror suspects. An example of that is the fact that the Kenyans on a technicality had to release one of the terror suspects in the bombings of the U.S. Embassy in Kenya and, and Dar es Salaam, uh, Haroun Fazul. Central Africa, sort of the same slate. Um, smuggling, uh, competing governance in the Great Lakes and Eastern Congo, um, and then of course the ungoverned territories, northern uh, parts of Central African Republic, uh, again the Gulf of Guinea. Uh, Southern Africa, uh, Southwest Indian Ocean, ma another maritime area that is for all intents and purposes ungoverned. 
the exploitation of legal principles I mentioned earlier, the, the example of that is the South African immigration laws and the fact that South African passports are highly sought after, particularly by uh, Pakistanis uh, who, uh, because the, the South Africans, of course, uh, have, there are a number of South Africans who are of South Asian descent. Um, it is not unusual at all to see someone who is of South Asian descent with a South African passport. A South African passport gets you into the Commonwealth. Once you're in the Commonwealth, you're good to go. Uh, the uh, South Africans, they're, they're the individuals involved in the London bombings, the subway bombings, uh, there were connections to individuals who were operating uh, out of South Africa. Uh, and then the last area in terms of opaque activity is the South African potential for unauthorized technology transfers. The South Africans, of course, have a, a very active military industrial complex. It's a small one, but uh, it, is, it is pretty well advanced. And uh, they produce uh, some very, uh, uh, very good niche technologies. The South Africans also have the laws and the structures to try and monitor the sale of their uh, military technology. But the problem is the South Africans don't necessarily have the capacity in terms of people uh, and sufficiently talented people within their government structure uh, to be able to implement their laws, rules, and regulations. So things, uh, things can leak out. Looking at how we, from a Defense Department perspective, uh, take a look at Africa these days in terms of our priorities, I see war on terrorism and weapons, uh, uh, weapons of mass destruction proliferation. And on that one, what I don't, our problem is not that we've got uh, African countries that are going to become uh, uh, nuclear weapons powers, um, but the issues there are, as I mentioned before, raw materials and then also potential smuggling uh, through African ports that are, are not regulated or other transportation nodes. The uh, strong military to military relationships is a priority. As, as I mentioned, in the current threat environment, we need partners. So we want to have good relationships with uh, African militaries as well as our traditional relationships with our NATO allies and, and with our with Australia, etc. Uh, the Africans are equally important. But in order to have those kinds of military relationships, those partnerships, we also have to have competent and capable African militaries and so hence the emphasis on military professionalization and reform and then building sustainable capacity. Then of course we do place a great deal of emphasis now on working with our European partners. People, uh, especially during the early days of the Iraq War, didn't believe me when I said that we had an excellent relationship with the French, but it's true. Um, uh, we, we did maintain an excellent relationship with the French in Africa because we had our, our interests were congruent and we worked well together. Uh, and then, of course, good governance and stability. We're obviously, that is a priority for us because if we have that, then we don't have the problem of ungoverned space. So what we did is we took all of those priorities and we kind of boiled them down into sort of three key pillars that uh, form the basis of how we approach our defense and military relations with the African continent and the uh, countries. Uh, promoting civilian control and defense reform developing professional military organizations, and then, of course, building capacity. And this gives you a little bit deeper definitions of each of those. In the case of civilian control and defense reform, we talk about appropriately sized and funded militaries. Appropriately sized doesn't mean that they're all the same size. Obviously, they have to be sized to deal with the security challenges that they face, each country faces. But they also have to be sized to fit the country's budget. You don't want a military that is that, that a country cannot afford uh, because that's just as much of a problem uh, at really as too small a military. And in fact, we are currently working with the Liberians. We have taken on the task, the United States has taken on the task of helping Liberia rebuild its military. 
We initially did an assessment that uh, an appropriately sized military, not resource dependent, would probably, for, for a country the size of Liberia and given its terrain environment, uh, the, the surrounding countries, the threats it would face, an appropriately sized military would be about 5,000 strong. Then we went and we looked at Liberian revenues that were expected to come in over the next couple of years. And we realized that Liberia couldn't afford a military that was more than 2,000 strong. So we told the Liberians they were going to have a military that was about 2,000 strong because that's all they could afford. Um, and uh, they, they have accepted that, and we are holding to that discipline. Um, we are working very closely with uh, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf on that, and, and they understand that while they too would like to have their full 5,000 man force, they need to have a force that is better to have 2,000 men who are, and women, who are appropriately paid, well trained, equipped, etc., than to have 5,000 poorly trained, poorly equipped, and unpaid uh, personnel. With regard to military professionalism, and the, uh, the issue of institutionalizing training. That is a, a key concept that is missing often from African philosophies about militaries. Their views of militaries tend to focus on acquiring equipment uh, first and then paying their people second and then maybe they might get to the issue of training. It is not, obviously that's not the way that the U.S. and Western militaries look at it. Uh, training is a key part, essentially, of the military's mission. Africans don't see it that way. And this is sort of an education issue uh, for us with them. We need to get them to understand that training needs to be considered as part of the mission. You, you've got to train on a regular basis. Uh, so. And that's key if you want to build capacity successfully. Because you can build all the capacity in the world, but if you don't train to keep it up, and if you don't maintain the equipment that uh, you have, all that capacity will just be frittered away quite quickly. So military professionalism and inculcating professional values into African militaries is a, is a major priority of ours. And we do that. Uh, with a number of tools, including a program that, uh, that Greg and I worked on a couple of years ago. Um, these are some of those tools, and of course it's an alphabet soup, um, as many Defense Department activities are, but to just sort of give you sort of some general descriptions, um, on the security assistance side, the tools that we have to work with are, are educational tools, where we have money, IMET, that allows us to bring African uh, military officers and enlisted personnel to the United States for training in U.S. military schools with U.S. military personnel. We also have foreign military financing which allows us to provide equipment and other supplies to African militaries as needed to help them sort of get a jump start in terms of building their capacity. We have our humanitarian assistance programs which are directed entirely at civilians, not at the military. Uh, so it allows us to go out and say uh, build a school or dig a well uh, in a village that needs a well. Um, we have of course our exercise programs and there are a number of, a number of exercises including our, our medical exercises um, which sort of double as both a, an exercise for us but also as a humanitarian assistance activity. We have our operational activities, um, peacekeeping, Humanitarian Relief Ops, which of course we, we have done more in the last decade uh, than uh, probably in, in any, uh, in the 50 years prior. Um, a couple of, of new, uh, new things that we have, new tools in our, our toolbox. Uh, ACODA, the Africa Contingency Operations Training and Assistance Program, uh, and the Global Peace Ops Initiative. ACODA is, is a subset. ACODA actually predated the Global Peace Operations Initiative. We, we, uh, those of us working in Africa like to pride ourselves on the fact that we are sort of a, ahead of the U.S. government power curve in thinking about the need to build capacity for peacekeeping operations in third world countries. Um, but uh, now that the Global Peace Ops Initiative has been created, 
uh, the, our, our Africa specific initiative is, is, uh, falls underneath that and is funded from that. Uh, under combined education, the Defense Department runs a series of, of regional centers that specialize uh, in the, you have the Marshall Center in Garmisch, Germany, specializing in the European, East Europe, the uh, uh, former Soviet Union areas. Uh, we have an Asia Pacific Center, uh, we have a Latin America Center, a NISA Center, and we have the African Center for Strategic Studies. And that African Center is based in Washington, D.C., although it has a satellite office in, in Addis in Ethiopia. And that's a key component of our, our work with African countries because it, what ACSS does is it provides a, a, a forum uh, for us to have a, a dialogue with the Africans about different security issues that they face and try to establish some common understandings about security issues. We, we hear their perspectives, they hear our perspectives, and that's a key tool in building partnerships. Okay, U.S. Africa Command. Yeah. And I'll finish up and then hopefully have a little bit of time for questions. Um, the President provided direction for Africa Command. Uh, we, it was announced publicly on the 7th of uh, February. The President actually provided the direction on the 15th of December. Um, this is a, a very significant development in terms of U.S. Defense Department structures. We have not built a regional command in, in 25 years. Uh, so uh, this, is a, this is a new initiative and the idea is that this actually isn't going to be your, your father's regional command, so to speak. It, it is going to be a, a different kind of command. We've already talked actually a lot about this in, in some ways in the negative. Um, we've talked about all the threats that emanate from Africa and all the problems in Africa. Uh, but there are also reasons that Africa is, is important that don't necessarily have to do with problems per se, but the, that are where it is just simply strategically significant. The fact that Africa now is, is nearing the 800 million mark in terms of population and in not too many years will cross the, the billion mark um, is, is significant. It means that, that Africans uh, are becoming an in increasing uh, force in, in the, uh, the global environment, uh, economically um, and, and just demographically. Uh, you also, of course, have Africa becoming a, an increasingly important player in the natural resources arena. Oil gets talked about most often, but there are other natural resources, uh, and key, key raw materials and minerals. That, uh, that many countries, including China, that gets talked about quite a lot now, are seeking in Africa. Africa has a great deal of influence in the United Nations. Uh, and, and now you know, we have South Africa on the, uh, the Security Council. The Africans are pushing for a permanent seat, so their voice is actually increasing globally. So Africa is, is not a continent to sort of be ignored or be sort of relegated to the, the category of, of just a humanitarian interest. Uh, it, is, it is much more important than that. So the focus of the Africa Command uh, is hopefully to try and reduce some of the turmoil that we've talked about, improve the level of security, which hopefully will also provide an environment that will allow for greater economic development and tap into that potential uh, that is there. Uh, and then, of course, address the terrorist problem and uh, respond to crises as needed. Some people have, have said, oh, well, looks like the Defense Department is trying to take over the State Department's job. It's trying to run U.S. foreign policy. And that is actually not the case. AFRICOM, to a certain extent, represents a recognition by the Defense Department of that slide that I showed you with the, the multiple colored circles. The fact that we can't work in a stovepipe and achieve our security objectives. We have to work with and in support of our colleagues uh, at the State Department, at USAID, and other U.S. government agencies that deal um, with Africa. 
So this is not DOD trying to take over. This is DOD essentially trying to be a, a team player. Uh, now, to the extent that as a member of the team, uh, we can bring, uh, we can use our capacities to help integrate other members of the team uh, more effectively, then that's something that we want to do and we want to contribute to the team. But our integration uh, efforts do not mean that we see ourselves taking the lead. We see ourselves very much in uh, a supporting relationship. Uh, the effect of this will essentially consolidate the responsibilities of three commands into one. And as I note, uh, our, in terms of being part of the team, what we hope to do is actually bring other members of the, we call the interagency, uh, that refers sort of euphemistically to the State Department, to, to USAID, to all the other government departments that we work with, Treasury, etc. Um, into the command to make them a part of the command, not outsiders who are dealing with the, the command as a closed entity, but actually uh, they will be with inside the command itself. Um, on the left side, you've got the map as it looks today. On the right side, you have the Africa map as it will look uh, hopefully in, uh, in September, or the end of September 2008. Um, a little bit of background on why it was like this and, and why, why we kept it like this. I, I, was, I was telling uh, Professor Kupferman earlier that um, Secretary Rumsfeld, uh, it was Secretary Rumsfeld that I think it, it really we have to give the credit to uh, for pushing forward the idea of, of an Africa command. It had been discussed and debated for a number of years and uh, there was always this feeling, well, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Um, but uh, one of the things that, is when Secretary Rumsfeld first came into the Pentagon, he sort of looked at Africa, and just from a businessman's perspective, he sort of scratched his head and he said, I don't understand why we've divided this up among three different commands. That doesn't make any sense. That's not very efficient. And the other thing he said in, was, oh, by the way, who was the knucklehead who decided to put Madagascar in Pacific Command? And so the Joint Staff actually dutifully went back and looked to find out who the knucklehead was. Turns out it was Donald Rumsfeld. <laughs> so he, um, that sort of became a, a running joke during his time in, in the office. Um, but uh, he initially looked at it in the context of efficiencies. And, and of course, other things kind of were put on his plate. And uh, it, it became something, again, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But um, when in 2003, when uh, we had the Liberia crisis, the <coughs> seventh Liberia crisis in just more than a decade, he, he refocused on Africa and he began to crystallize his thinking that was also ultimately reflected in the Quadrennial Defense Review about the need in the current environment, and I talked about this earlier, to prevent problems from becoming crises and crises from becoming catastrophes. And in his mind, at, we needed to do that in Africa. We couldn't afford to continue to just react to African catastrophes. And so, and one of the ways that we could do that was having the Defense Department focus on Africa as opposed to having Africa be a sort of a secondary or tertiary uh, a priority for other co uh, combatant commands. And if you look at the way it was organized initially, the rationale was, of course, most of the, the European command AOR was dominated by European colonial powers. So the linkage there was to NATO and Europe, which is so very much, again, a, sort of a Cold War uh, perspective on the continent. Uh, the Horn of Africa uh, was a jumping off point to the Middle East, particularly it, it became more important. We signed our, our first access agreement with an African country with Kenya uh, in 1980, um, and it became, it became more important after the decade of the 70s when we, we lost uh, our base in, uh, in what is now Eritrea, what was then Ethiopia, Cagney Station. Uh, and of course the turmoil in the Middle East and we, we felt we needed a place 
where we, we could base ourselves if we needed to project power into the Middle East. So the horn was seen in relationship to the Middle East. So Africa was never really seen as a strategic end in and of itself. It was always a means to some other strategic end. Even during the Cold War, if you think about it, we were in, engaged and involved in Africa. We were involved in Congo. We were involved in, in Angola and a number of places. But all of that was not about Africa. It was really about the competition with the Soviet Union. So again, the way we looked at Africa was never really looking at Africa. We were always looking at something else. So now we are in a new security environment. Cold War is long gone. And actually, what was interesting in the 1990s when we were looking at Africa, we, we couldn't figure out in, in, in the wake of the end of the Cold War and the fall of the wall, there was this great debate in terms of what was the relevance of Africa now, now that we didn't, we didn't have to compete for influence with the Soviet Union. Well, then why did we care or why should we care? And the initial answer was, well, gee, it really, it's only sort of, it's economic and it's humanitarian, and that's pretty much it. Um, that, of course, changed significantly after 9-11. And again, go back to the issue of, of ungoverned space. And Africa begins to become important for itself, not, again, as a means to another end. What's AFRICOM going to do? Uh, well, these are sort of its primary tasks. And what I would note uh, or call your attention to is the fact that these are not war fighting tasks. And when I said that this is not your father's combatant command, I meant it. Um, combatant commands are, well, they're combatant commands. They are, the other term for them is war fighting commands. And uh, the, so that's their focus. The focus of AFRICOM is, as you can see, capacity building. Um, and one of the ways that I sort of like to describe it, it's not that we won't have the capacity or the capability, because you see that down at the bottom as directed conduct military operations. It's not that we won't have the capability to do it, but it's sort of like our vision is sort of like the fire department. In the past, DOD was like the fire department that stayed in its firehouse and shined its engines and waited for the great conflagration to break out, and then you rush out and you try and put the fire out and, and uh, deal with the damage. Now what we want to do is obviously we're still going to have the capacity to rush out with our, our shiny engines and put fires out, but before we do that, we hope to be out in the communities working to help prevent fires by talking about fire safety and by uh, talking about installing sprinklers and et cetera, et cetera, so that Hopefully, if we do that, uh, we will reduce the likelihood of fires. And if there is a fire, uh, that fire will actually be less intense than it would have been otherwise if we hadn't been doing all that work. So the focus of AFRICOM is on a different end of the spectrum. It's on the, the prevention end of the spectrum as opposed to the reaction end of the spectrum. This is our draft mission statement for the command. Um, and it takes all of those things that uh, you just saw, those tasks, and kind of tries to encapsulate them. Uh, this is uh, sort of a in classic DOD mission statement speak. Um, but again, what I call your attention to is the fact that you've got all these lines up on top, and only down at the very bottom do you have as directed, U.S. Africa Command conducts military operations to deter aggression and respond to crises. If you look at all the other commands, it actually would be reversed. That statement would be essentially up top as opposed to down on the bottom. So where do we go from here? Um, we are currently, we have a transition team that is in place temporarily in, uh, in Germany, in Stuttgart. Uh, they are beginning to sort of build and become the nucleus for what will be Africa Command. Eventually, we will establish the command on the continent. Uh, but and as I said, I think I mentioned earlier, uh, we, the date that, that the president gave us was 30 September, fiscal year 08. Uh, there's a lot of details to be developed. One of the reasons, though, that we went public with this effort, I mean, it was already leaking out a lot, but we 
even though we don't, we, all we really have is a skeleton, we don't have a lot of flesh on the bones, but one of the reasons that we did that is because we wanted to leave ourselves uh, an opportunity to consult with the Africans themselves about how they see and perceive their security issues, their, their interests, uh, so that we could build AFRICOM in a way that would, would be, uh, it, it would involve a consultative process with the Africans. It wasn't something we were going to impose on them. It was something that w where we would build it with them to a certain extent. I mean, obviously, it's our organizational structure, and we do have to build, do certain things to meet our needs. But uh, we do want to take into account the African perspective on their security threats and try to address that in the way we structure the command. So, conclusion. Uh, we're recognizing the strategic importance of Africa. Some people would say, you know, gee, you know, where, where have you guys been? Well, okay, true, true enough. Uh, it, it has been strategically important for a long time. It didn't just become strategically important, but okay, better late than never that we finally recognized it. We are looking to build an innovative command structure, a 21st century command, not a 20th century hierarchical J-code structure. Um, that's difficult for the Department of Defense because we're very hierarchical and we're very rigid in our organizational structures, but uh, that's our goal. And again, the emphasis is on building partnership capacity to strengthen security and stability. And that's it. Okay, great. We have uh, about 20 minutes for questions, so um, just raise your hands. And all I would ask is uh, when you're recognized, if you would identify uh, your name and uh, your institutional affiliation. Uh, Josh Smith for the LBJ School. Uh, you often hear that weak governance and, and or state failure will create safe havens for terrorists, but it seems to me uh, a certain hyperbole, and I wonder that, that it makes us, the U.S. feel responsible for African governance everywhere. And I, I wonder if state uh, failure occurs anywhere in Africa, that ne it, does that necessarily create a security risk for us? No, not necessarily. There are other conditions that obviously have to be sort of present to create a security risk. Um, a good example is probably Congo, uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo, which uh, you you can't really argue that uh, Kinshasa has a significant amount of control over over the state. It, do, but do we consider it a a risk in terms of uh, of producing terrorists? No, I mean uh, at least not right now. We haven't seen any indications of that that it's a problem. It's partly because of of the uh, the demographics, the population, it's, in, it's primarily non-Muslim. Um, uh, it, it's also, uh, it also doesn't have sort of the, the factors or the, the sort of the logistic advantages that would make it a place that a, an outsider would want to go to in order to uh, train or, or set up his uh, safe haven. Um, it, it's too it's too difficult to get to. It's too difficult to move around. So it's it's not just bad government or bad governance or misgovernance or lack of governance that uh, contributes to a country becoming potentially a safe haven for terrorists or um, potentially producing terrorists. I think there there are other factors. The places that we're most concerned about. Um, Somalia is one, uh, and uh, we've, we've had, uh, of course, the recent experience with the Council of Islamic Courts and the, the rise of, of radical Islam in Somalia as a potential unifying factor since all other factors, uh, all, all other attempts to unify Somalia didn't work. Um, that, of course, has now been uh, defeated by the Ethiopians, but there's still this sort of this nascent uh, radicalism uh, in uh, Somali society right now. The question is, who's going to win out, the, the clan structure or the, uh, the radical Islam structure? And, and that's still, most people think the clan structure will ultimately squash the radical Islam, but um, it's still sort of an open question. So it's an area that we look at. Um, other areas that we look at are sort of the, the Sahel region. Um, because there are indigenous groups in the Sahel region and in North Africa 
that um, have our indigenous parish groups that have operated there with their own little regional objectives. And uh, those groups, uh, one of the trends that we have noticed, and this has uh, sort of manifested itself with the, um, the Algerian terrorist group that was known as the Salifist Group for Preaching and Combat, the GSPC, uh, which was a breakaway group from the GIA. Um, that group was really sort of uh, uh, losing its relevance, and it, it decided that, gee, in order to maintain its relevance, that uh, it might be a good idea to join the Al-Qaeda bandwagon. And uh, that's exactly what they've done. And this is a problem with some of these regional groups that uh, they, they wanted to join the movement. Uh, and so we, you, you've got the uh, Libyan Islamic Fighting Group, you've got groups in Morocco, etc. Um, and even if they don't affiliate themselves directly with the movement like the GSPC has, and they've actually even changed their name, they're now called Al-Qaeda in the land of the Islamic Maghreb, so A-Q-L-I-M uh, is, is now their new name. Um, but even if they don't directly affiliate in that way, they oftentimes do facilitate or sort of do contract operations, they, they sort of branch, branch offices, so to speak. Um, so those are the places, and then so you take those sort of existing factors and then you overlay the problem of bad governance and inability uh, to govern or provide security, and that's where you sort of get that, that sort of more deadly mix, so to speak, uh, where you get a greater threat. Um, so, no, not, not every problem of bad governance needs to be a national security problem. I mean, I mean we'd like to be able to be helpful to African countries in terms of uh, promoting good governance across the board, but uh, obviously we're going to prioritize things uh, differently based on the presence of other factors. Uh, Adam Goldman, unaffiliated. Curious as to whether or not you're planning on putting this new command in a specific country, and if so, um, the headquarters, and if so, uh, why in a specific um, we are planning on putting the command on the continent, uh, and obviously, d depending on how there, there's a number of different uh, thoughts right now about how we should do that, whether we we should go with a traditional single headquarters or whether we should go with a more distributed model, uh, and so we could end up being in more than one country, um, but. Uh, we have not settled on on any one place, although we do have countries already that are uh, sending us letters or, or making uh, solicitations to us uh, and volunteering their their territory. So uh, that's that's something that uh, we'll probably decide over the course of the next six months in terms of uh, how we want to do it: single headquarters or distributed, and then and then where. from MBJ School. Um, one point of clarification and then a question. So the point of clarification, it seems from your response to a question that you are, the DOD is really concerned about not just any ungoverned spaces, but ungoverned spaces with uh, Muslim population in Africa. Right. And, then, it, okay, so, and the question is... Well, uh, let, me, let me clarify that. I mean, there, there are obviously stability issues for example, we are focused on rebuilding the, the military in Liberia, um, and we are we are concerned about Liberia gaining the capacity, Monrovia, to to govern Liberia. Uh, finally, um, be, why? Because as I said, we we conducted seven non-combatant evacuation operations from Liberia you know, over the course of uh, 12 years. And numerous times, DOD assets had to sit off the coast of Liberia um, for months um, in order to promote security. So it's not just there, – there, there are issues from our perspective and reasons outside of the issue of terrorism that we should try to be helpful in promoting good governance and building security capacity. My question is regarding the, the 
age epidemic, and you mentioned it briefly, not only in terms of absenteeism in the military, but also some countries really finding it hard to find enough for the, for the pool of healthy people that they can that they recruit for the army is shrinking. Right. Uh, but the U.S. assistance for AIDS epidemic in Africa uh, goes through the USAID, you know, the PEPFAR initiative, etc. It's based basically on the need, and so it is going to countries with the highest HIV AIDS rates. Uh, would in the future the DOD play any part in terms of decisions of uh, foreign assistance allocation in Africa? Well, actually, on the HIV AIDS, um, we in the Department of Defense actually had an HIV AIDS program that predated the PEPFAR program. Uh, we originally we called it the Life Initiative, but uh, it's, it now falls under the name of the DHAM, <coughs> and I f actually forget the acronym. But in any case, it's Defense Department funded uh, program uh, where we help promote. Um, education about and prevention uh, for HIV AIDS. Now our, our monies are such that we can't do uh, the um, uh, antiretrovirals or treatments, but, but we've, we do focus on education and, and prevention and testing. And we are involved in 30 African countries uh, in terms of providing training to the militaries. In some cases we do it uh, directly, it's a DOD uh, direct assistance. In some cases, we actually have a contractor that does it for us in some of the smaller countries. So uh, we've actually been very involved in that. When PEPFAR came online, we partnered with PEPFAR. With, and where PEPFAR places its money, um, we actually get our money for DOD programs from PEPFAR. That allows us to take our DOD dollars and place them in those countries that are not getting PEPFAR focus. So we, we have been very concerned about the impacts of HIV AIDS on militaries and their capacities. And so that's, we've, we've actually been involved in that now since uh, this was two, 2000, 1999, 2000 was the first time that we uh, began putting money towards this. Uh. Greg Engel at the LBJ School, also a Department of State employee. Um, just one observation, Teresa, and then a question. This is the interagency at work, folks. This is, well, this might be one of the best uh, examples <laughs> of interagency cooperation that I've experienced in my career working with Teresa. Um, one is uh, among the factors that you list for security vulnerabilities in Africa uh, and why they exist. I would recommend adding the fact that African leaders don't hold each other to account. They're starting to get, I mean, it's, it's yeah, really an important point. factor right, because mm -hmm. it determines what they what they can do in their regional organizations and otherwise. Uh, I think we're starting to see some improvements, particularly in the African Union uh, with Canary and, and uh, yeah, a little bit. but it's, but it wouldn't, you wouldn't write home about them yet. But I do think that's a very important yeah, that's a good point. factor. Uh, and then the second is sort of a question with regard to to the African command. Uh, first, I, I know states sort of applauds that we've we've encouraged that for for years and think that it will bring a lot more sort of coherence and cohesiveness to to our activities there. But there there are two possibilities uh, with regard to resourcing. Uh, one is that, gee, now you've got an African command that doesn't have to, so that so that activities in Africa don't have to come begging to UCOM or CENTCOM or PACOM or whatever, and can be funded on their own. That could be the good news. That could be the bad news. Uh, and so I guess I'd like to hear from you. You know, what's the calculus that somehow Africa standing on its own will be adequately, the command will be adequately resourced to deliver the goods. Um, I mean, that's the intention, and one of the reasons that we decided to go with the unified command as opposed to sub-unified command is so that the COCOM could sit with his fellow COCOMs up on Capitol Hill and, and argue with the same, the same force uh, that uh, the European command did. Or, but, but AFRICOM should have its own Title X budget uh, that's commensurate with its Title X requirements uh, and that way it doesn't have to feed off of a European Command Title 10 budget or a Central Command Title 10 budget, 90% of which goes, say, to the Middle East and only a small slice goes to the Horn. So 
we we hope that the fact that it is a standalone command will will essentially force uh, and and Congress actually has called for this themselves. I mean, they put and I think there were at least three requirements in the current uh, defense appropriation bill that required us to report to them by this April on the feasibility of standing up an Africa command. These were three separate requirements. Now, of course, we've sort of done them one better and we've decided to stand it up. But we, you know, they're saying they want it, so we're going to go back to them and say, okay, you said you want it. Now you've got to provide sufficient funding for it. Um, obviously, the other type of funding is Title 22. And we're also going to try to use the command to leverage greater Title 22 funding for a greater share of the Title 22 funding for uh, Africa. Okay, we'll bite. What's Title 22? Oh, I'm sorry. I went to, I, I, I'm sorry about that. Title, there's two, yeah, sorry, uh, DOD interagency speak or State Department speak, really. Um, is very sort of strange uh, arrangement because the State Department doesn't trust us. Um, they want to make sure that uh, they have control over the, uh, the foreign assistance resources that go to developing uh, uh, capacity in, in foreign militaries. So we have this interesting relationship in which uh, the money uh, money for, for foreign military training, for foreign military equipment, is actually placed in the State Department's foreign assistance budget, which is known as the Title 22. The mm -hmm. DOD budget is, there's two components to the DOD budget. There's uh, the 050 account, uh, Title 50, essentially, and, there, and then a subset of that is Title 10, um, which is actually Title 10 monies are really very small. That's where our humanitarian, DOD humanitarian assistance monies come from uh, the, and, and a few, a few other, the education, educa the exactly. Uh, mm -hmm. The HIV AIDS uh, monies that I was talking about earlier also come from Title 10 resources. But the, the majority of the tools that we would have when I talk mm -hmm. about capacity building and training and equipping, all that belongs to Greg. Um, and so I have to be nice to Greg. <laughs> um, well, actually, it's not entirely that. So Congress gave the money to the State Department, but what they also did, though, is they made rules that says that only the Defense Department can actually spend certain types of money. So foreign military financing can only be spent by the Defense Security Cooperation Agency. State Department can't spend it, so they have to give it to us. Um, they also cannot spend IMET money. Uh, there's a new kind of money called peacekeeping operations money that came into being in the mid-90s that actually can be spent by both State Department and DOD. Um, and so it, it's a little bit more flexible than those other types. But that's um, what Title 22 is. And, and it, is, it is a very critical component of what we are able to do uh, in Africa. I hope that explanation will not deter any of those of you who are getting masters in public affairs from actually going into a career in public affairs. <laughs> it's not that bad. <laughs> Frank Gavin, the LBJ School. Uh, thanks, Teresa, for a fascinating talk. I, I think that it was perhaps even more radical than you would even, uh, even know. As I was sitting here thinking, I thought, your notion of what you laid out as to what is strategy and what is the role of the U.S. military struck me as something almost foreign to anything I had ever heard of. And I tried to picture a senior Defense Department official from 15 or 20 years ago coming to this talk and thinking that they sort of had entered a totally different planet. Um, the notion that you would tell someone that ungoverned spaces in Africa was somehow a core security threat. I was trying to imagine, and maybe Admiral Inman could, uh, could comment on that, but it, it just, it was hard to picture. And as I started to tease this out, I thought there's, there's three big assumptions, three pretty controversial assumptions in this whole strategy in, in your talk. The first is the idea that somehow ungoverned spaces are worse than governed spaces. Uh, governed spaces, especially when they're really well governed, are efficient at projecting power. That's what scares me. Right? People who are really good at governing and don't like me are able to get their act together. 
Ungoverned spaces, there's problems. We all know what they are, but they're usually more concerned with themselves. Their ability to project power is negligible. So that's the first assumption. The second assumption is that the issue with these ungoverned spaces, that the best way of dealing with it is for an external power to go in and help to build governing capacity, or use a phrase that you didn't use, nation building. Right? There are other, well, if I think of ungoverned spaces or bad places, I'd say, do I want to go in there and fix it, or do I want to avoid it? Do I want to quarantine it? Do I want to just stay far away from it? Is my intervention going to actually make things work? Because governance is very difficult. And the third big assumption is that, let's just say I assume the first two are, are correct, that the US military is the correct instrument for carrying out uh, this strategy. I mean, we could spend a very long time discussing what the issues are there. So I guess my question is, how confident are you that you're correct in all three of these assumptions? Because this is a massive political <laughs> experiment. <laughs> I'll, yeah, no. I'll give you 30 seconds to answer. Okay. <laughs> well, it, as far as, I mean, your, your first point goes to what I was saying about, yeah, the way that we conceptualize security was always in terms of the threats come from governed space, because that's a space that can project military power. But we're thinking, that's when you're thinking of threats in terms of state actors. Ungoverned space, the threat isn't the state itself. It can't do anything to you. Um, the problem is non-state actors taking advantage of that ungoverned space. Um, and, and of course, that's what we saw an example of in 9-11. In you had a non-state actor using a, a, a place, using Afghanistan, which for a long time had, become, had been ungoverned, but became essentially, a, 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 I mean, the Al-Qaeda sort of financed the Taliban into existence. But in any case, you had a non-state actor taking advantage of that space in order to uh, prepare a strategy um, and carry out uh, uh, an attack that struck at you know, the heart of the United States, which is something that nobody could have imagined before 9-11. I, uh, I think it was Salman Rushdie that wrote an article around the time of Rwanda or right after talking about you know, failure of the imagination. And that, I think, is sort of one of our biggest challenges, particularly in doing intelligence and warning is that sometimes we, we can't conceptualize some of the threats that, uh, that we might face. And that was certainly one that we couldn't conceptualize. We gave up on Afghanistan and, you know, after the Soviets pulled out. Who cared? You know, it was a sad situation. Too bad all those Afghans keep beating each other over the head. But it's really far away. It's not our problem. Um, all of a sudden, uh, it became our problem uh, in uh, in my building and and in the uh, in the towers. Um, so I think that was sort of a bracing experience to think that you know, a, a bunch of a bunch of guys uh, could essentially do uh, wreak destruction on the United States that previously had only been uh, executed by uh, Japan. Um, when they bombed Pearl Harbor, a uh, major military power, um, and that we only imagined that the Soviet Union could uh, could carry out, or maybe China, but we we're more focused obviously on the Soviet Union uh, by lobbing uh, nuclear missiles at us. So the the concern is that if you completely ignore the problem, that you could have a repeat of that event because you, won't, you will not be paying attention to the little group that sets itself up in some remote corner of the world and busily gathers all of the parts for a, uh, a dirty bomb or a, a, you know, some other kind of, of uh, weapon um, that can be used to terrorize the United States. Okay, that's assumption one, and I don't agree with you, but I still move, so what do you do about it? Where, why would nation building be strategy that would be best well I think the 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 thinking is that the and it's not the it is and it isn't nation building and to go to your your third assumption the Defense Department is not saying that it's the right tool to do this what the Defense Department is saying is that it is a there is it is a tool um, the security is a component of stability it is not the only component of stability, but it is a component. And if you do not have it present, you, you cannot 
you cannot have economic development, you cannot have all the other things um, that are necessary for a country to thrive as opposed to just sort of survive. So what we're saying is that we see a need to focus some of our energy and effort uh, as opposed to just focusing our, our military on uh, the threat from China, and it's not that we've we're not focusing on China, but as opposed to focusing all of our energy at that, and focusing all of our energy at uh, at fighting, you know, a conventional war somewhere or an insurgent war as we've got in Iraq, that we can use some of our energy to try and help build the capacity of these other countries to do a better job of securing their own territory, which will make them safer. Um, and will also hopefully make us a little bit safer. Um, I don't say that it completely solves the problem. I also wouldn't argue that simply building security capacity by itself solves the problem. You've got to work the other pieces and, and that's where the issue about integration across the U.S. government working with the State Department, working with USAID, those that are working the development issues and the, the, the good governance issues. We want to, we simply want to work with them in our little slice of the pie. And our little slice is really actually quite small. It, it is strictly the military. We don't even work with police forces. We're obviously prohibited from doing that. So that's, that's kind of where, where we're going is greater integration, focus on this capacity building um, and to, to the extent that we can and to the extent that our resources allow. Obviously we're going to be resource constrained. We, there is no way that we can build the capacity of, uh, of African militaries to be sort of the equivalent of a, of a small European power or even a, uh, you know, a Middle Eastern military. We don't have enough resources to do that. But if we can increase their capacity even even marginally, um, we may have addressed uh, uh, part of our problem. Um, you know, you had a mil you had uh, Chad and Niger, for example, just a couple of, of years ago, um, working together. They had never worked together before, but we brought them together um, through various planning conferences and, and military exchanges. We encouraged them to communicate. We provided them with information. They worked together, and they were able to uh, jointly defeat a, uh, a, a, part, a part of the GSPC, one of the zones run by a, a commander named Alpara, and um, and that was that was just doing simple stuff. It was it was literally having the chiefs of defense from Niger and from Chad come up to European command and meet each other. What a shock! Um, and exchange phone numbers. Um, and, uh, in, and then it was our providing information to, to those militaries about what was going on in their territories and helping them focus the, the small resources that they had in the right place at the right time. And in the end, uh, they actually uh, defeated the cell. So you, I think you can, you can do a lot, in my view, with a little in Africa, because all you really need is, is, a, is some marginal improvements in order to, to have a significant impact. We're essentially out of time. I, 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 um, I will, however, abuse the prerogative of the chair to just ask a quick follow-up on Frank's question, which maybe would, would, would um, by going to a specific case, maybe put some meat on, on, on the bone of the excellent skeleton he set up. And, and that is the fact that you're talking about this threat from ungoverned spaces, but, but DOD hasn't given up the concern about the threat from governed spaces, no. uh, even in Africa. And, and, and so I would point then to the recent case of Somalia, where, which was for a very, very long time an ungoverned space until about mid-2006, when it finally became a governed space. Um, the, this is, the Islamic courts movement was the first movement that had managed to consolidate control over the bulk of Somalia uh, in 15 years. And so it went from an ungoverned space to a governed space. And what the U.S. government's reaction was to that is, we don't like this governed space because this governed space may have links to some of the folks who attacked us in 1998 and um, may have links to Al-Qaeda. And 
So, as reported in the media, we supported the Ethiopian military going in and overthrowing the Islamic courts and turning a governed space into an ungoverned space. Uh, and now there is a renewed civil strife in Somalia. It really has gone from a governed space to an ungoverned space. So we have concerns about governed spaces and we have concerns about ungoverned spaces. And my question to you is, in the specific case of Somalia, did the leadership of the Pentagon realize that in addressing a governed space problem, they were going to create an ungoverned space problem? Yeah. And did they and did they say, in this case, the ungoverned space would be better than the governed space? Or were they kind of unaware of what they were doing? Oh, <laughs> well, let's see. Maybe it's louder. No, actually, um, to be perfectly honest, I think the media um, uh, sort of uh, portrayed the relationship between the United States and Ethiopia on this issue uh, they, they, a little bit inaccurately, in as much as the we did not encourage the Ethiopians to go in and eliminate the the CIC. Um, in fact, we had sort of a long-running dialogue about the pros and cons of doing that with them because they were they were telling us about their concerns and how they were growing increasingly concerned about the CIC. Um, we were advocating dialogue between the TFG and the CIC in order to develop a, uh, a, a, a unified government, obviously recognizing that the, the CIC was sort of a reality, but uh, the TFG was the government that was recognized by the UN based on the, the, uh, the international process that led to it. And so now we obviously didn't want to see the radical elements of the CIC pulled in, but we felt that there might be some elements of the CIC that, that through dialogue should be brought into uh, the, the overall TFG. The Ethiopians were uh, fairly alarmed, though, about the nature of the CIC. So the decision to go after them was actually the Ethiopians and the Ethiopians alone. And in fact, they were being strongly advised by some that they really shouldn't do this um, because there could be all kinds of negative consequences for them. They could get trapped in Mogadishu. They could get caught in a, a long slog against an insurgent uh, force, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So um, nobody in, in uh, Washington uh, whispered in the Ethiopians' ears that, hey, go, go knock these guys out. We'll support you. Now, of course, once they did it, um, you know, we, we found there was an opportunity, partly because when they did it, they sort of disrupted um, Mogadishu in such a way that the various and sundry nefarious characters that we were interested in all started running out of Mogadishu. And that was the first time that we had the ability uh, to essentially target them, go after them. And so we essentially took advantage of a situation that the Ethiopians created. Um, were we concerned about the, the CIC and about Sheikh Awes and uh, his pronouncements and where, where he was going? Yes. Were we concerned about the fact that once the CIC came into power um, that it actually began to facilitate um, the influx and the flow of more uh, radicals into Somalia and actually they started to develop small training camps? Yes. And what's interesting is prior to that, prior to the CIC's coming to power, Somalia didn't be, wasn't as much of a safe haven um, as people thought that it might be um, in, in 2001 uh, time frame. And that was partly because of the complex clan structure. And if you're not a Somali, it's really hard to operate in Somalia unless you have a Somali who is, who is supporting you. Um, so it, it, was, it was a safe haven for a small number of what we call Al-Qaeda in East Africa, but it never became a major training center um, because of this sort of unique sort of Somali clan politics issue. But once the CIC came in, we actually saw it moving in the, the direction of becoming a, 
what eventually could be a state sponsor of terrorism. And so that, that was worrisome. Um, so there is a tension. Now, yes, it, you, you prefer to have governed space, um, <coughs> but in some cases, there, the, you know, it, the, the ungoverned space could be the lesser of two evils. If if you're if the governed space that you're looking at is a radical Islamic government that espouses the principles of global jihad and wants to facilitate that and actually uses its governance capacity to do so, you know, and, and in that case you get back to I think the more traditional uh, concept of a nation state sort of being a threat and projecting a threat in an unconventional way, obviously. They're not going to lob nukes at you, but they could they could lob something equally as, as dangerous. I think you just made Professor Gavin feel better. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't, I'm not sure if I feel better. Um, well, that was, uh, that was really wonderful. It was a tour de force. Uh, it's hard to cover the military, economic, uh, aids, and, and governance issues of 48 countries in uh, an hour. And uh, you did it about as well as anyone possibly could. So I hope you'll join me in thanking <laughs> you.